All over the world, there is a growing discontent with the institutional churches among worshippers. Hordes of worshippers are walking away from the institutional churches and this is not because of the general belief that people who leave have walked away from God. On the contrary, they are leaving to preserve their faith in God. Many of them, matter-of-factly, did not know the true rest that comes from knowing Christ until they walked out the door of the institutional churches. So many more are just hearing the gospel that they never heard in decades of their sojourn in institutional church, courtesy of the internet. They walked out of institutional churches into Christ. Nowadays, the institutional churches are afraid of the internet. They warn their followers to disregard it because their own doctrines and practices cannot stand the open scrutiny obtainable online. Many institutional churches are nothing but traps and iron cages. Some will conveniently pass for slavery camps playing host to slaves who have fallen in love with their chains and slave masters. The institutional churches have been hijacked by men. They are owned by men, and not by God. They have driven Christ, the owner of the church away from their midst. If God is in charge, then we can call it ministry but if men, then it is a business, no matter how it is carefully wrapped in piety. Friends, please stop despising people who walked away because their eyes got opened to discern business centers that masquerade as the Church of God. They have been able to see what you have not yet seen. In the face of intimidating religious structures and empires that surround us, it will take real discernment to know that God's hand is not in many celebrated places that you know. They have embarked on a boisterous religious journey, they still prophesy in God's name and do the spectacular to mesmerize the crowds following them, giving them the assumption that God is in their midst. The experience can be likened to the parents of Jesus who had gone on a three-day journey under the assumption that Jesus was in their company. Alas, he was not there. In like manner, many religious zealots are full of assumptions. Friends, if you ever walked away from a bondage crafted by religion, expect religious people who know next to nothing about God to despise and spite you. It is their way. It is because they do not know any better. When Nicodemus saw the light and was trying to walk away from the trap of Pharisaism, it was a tough one for him. Hence, he could not visit Jesus during the daytime for fear of being seen by his trap mates, the Pharisees. He went under the cover of the night. Friends, if you have ever walked away from a slavery that is dressed in religious garb, please stand firm in Christ Jesus. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Galatians 5 1 the mere fact that we see, God's hands, manifesting in our lives and our midst in spite of our imperfections and unsound scriptural practices should not give validation to these unsound doctrines and practices. When the army of migrating Israel needed water desperately in the wilderness, God told Moses to speak to the rock but he did the opposite. He struck the rock twice, instead and yet, water gushed out abundantly. God's magnanimity in meeting the needs of his people in spite of their inadequacies or flawed practices should not be mistaken for validation. Anyone who keeps throwing around the, it works for me, mantra so is to validate his unsound doctrinal practices and lifestyles is deeply ignorant. The value that some people place on what they call proof of ministry today is a reflection of their paganistic background which they have not totally detached themselves from. It is native to paganism to adore anything that works, without recourse to whether it is consistent with the will of God or not. To those who confidently say things like, you can't argue with proofs, I keep wondering what version of the Bible they read. Many in church of today are celebrating paganistic practices all in the name of, it is working, but God's standard remains sure. He's waiting patiently to have everyone come to the knowledge of the truth, the knowledge of the Son of God and to the maturity of his full stature. What does your mentor showcase to you as evidences of his calling? What does he parade before you as proofs of being used of God? What does he advertise to you as evidences of success in ministry? In other words, what attracts you to him? 
why has he become your mentor? Paul, one of the prominent early apostles and someone who played a fatherly role to another young church leader named Timothy wrote to him. But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach, and how I live, and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, but the Lord rescued me from all of it. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil people and impostors will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. 2 Timothy 3 10-13 from the foregoing, it seems to me that Paul was emphasizing some attributes that young Timothy should look out for in a servant of God. I suppose strange miracles took place in Paul's ministry but he did not showcase them to Timothy. Paul began by telling Timothy, you know my doctrine. In other words, you know what I teach. Friends, a servant of God is known, first and foremost by what he teaches and not by what miracles he performs or the good things of life that he has. A man of God is known by his doctrine and not by his financial net worth. Going through Pauline epistles will make it abundantly clear what Paul taught. His message was Jesus and the redemption he purchased for man. Furthermore, Paul showcased his manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions. 2 Timothy 3 10-11 Friends, Paul even showcased perseverance, persecution and afflictions. Strange it might appear, especially when you place his testimony side by side what present-day preachers that seek to mentor others display before them. Paul endured persecution but present-day preachers cannot stand it. They cannot even stand criticism of their doctrines, let alone their way of life. I heard one man say to his congregation, by the reason of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, anyone who is after you goes this week. And everywhere was agog with the sound of, Amen. They curse from their pulpits anyone who is against them or criticizes their doctrine. Their foot soldiers, sons and daughters of papas, are everywhere sending warnings and threats to anyone who disagrees with their papas. Friends, if we are careful to study, and we are dispassionate about big names and popularity, it doesn't take much to decipher false teachers who are in influence and affluence, deceiving the mammoth crowds following them. Paul did not parade the donkeys he bought, if any, as a sign of success in ministry to Timothy. He didn't talk about numbers and crowds. Please, listen to me for once. Those displaying private jets, crowds, financial net worth, travels, platforms, and the large empires that they have built as signs of ministerial successes are lying to you. There is no such precedence in the Word of God. My heart bleeds each time I see young ministers who are genuinely passionate for God blindly follow after these men who have succeeded in derailing the gospel and changed the glory of God to gold and the blessing of God to money and physical materials. Stop following those who dangle before you, testimonies of good things of life as evidences of divine calling. I am not averse to good things of life, but they are not the testimony of success in ministry. The man of God, from Judah who came to prophesy against an altar in Bethel could not be derailed by the king who offered him attractive gifts but it took an old prophet, who also had good things of life on display to derail him. The old prophet reportedly saddled a donkey to ferry him back and set a sumptuous table before him. And that was his end. Please wake up. Your much-loved mentor may be the one derailing you. Stop looking for attractive platforms. Stay with purpose. The greatest miracle that God ever did was not the historical parting of the Red Sea to allow a mammoth crowd to pass or the collapse of a massive and fortified wall of Jericho at the sound of the trumpet. The greatest manifestation of God is not in the healing of the sick or the raising of the dead. The greatest show that God ever put forth in the affairs of man is in the provision for the salvation of his soul, the mystery of the exchange that took place at Calvary when Jesus took the place of man and the sin of the world was judged on him, where the atoning sacrifice for sin was made, once and for all. 
It was made once and it is good for all times. It is this mystery that turn even a vilest defender to the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It is the one that makes a man righteous before God. It is a gift and an unmerited favor. While the devil can mimic any other miracle, he cannot give righteousness. That is why he would rather have us go silent about this precious gift from God to those who believe. And true to life the church has been silent about it. Anyone who speaks about it is even considered heretic. There is something called the gift of righteousness to those who are in Christ Jesus. Please don't hesitate to embrace it, otherwise, your unrest in religion continues. To the Romans, Paul wrote, Our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us and he now declares us flawless in his eyes. This means we can now enjoy true and lasting peace with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, has done for us. Romans 5 1. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 1. Therefore, since we have been justified, that is, acquitted of sin, declared blameless before God, by faith, let us grasp the fact that, we have peace with God, and the joy of reconciliation with Him, through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed. Romans 5 1. It is the way God sees me. It is a declaration by God. It is not a feeling. The righteous life that we seek to live is an offshoot of this and not a validation of it. When Paul, a man who was adept in what it meant to achieve righteousness by working for it using the instrument of the law understood this, being a blameless Pharisee, he had this to say, and may be found in him, believing and relying on him, not having any righteousness of my own derived from, my obedience to the law and its rituals, but possessing, that genuine righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Philippians 3, 9. He also said in another place concerning his fellow Jews who refused to embrace this gift of being made right with God by faith. For I testify about them that they have a certain enthusiasm for God, but not in accordance with correct and vital, knowledge, about him and his purposes. For not knowing about God's righteousness which is based on faith, and seeking to establish their own, righteousness based on works, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Romans 10, 2-3 Today, I see a trend in which well-meaning Christians want us to be ashamed of proclaiming the righteousness that comes from God through faith in Christ's redemption work but be proud of the one we could achieve by our good works. This is like putting the cart before the horse. But we are gone past being ashamed of it. It is a gift and we are not going to hush it. Paul wrote, for in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, both springing from faith and leading to faith disclosed in a way that awakens more faith. As it is written and forever remains written, the just and upright shall live by faith. Romans 1 17. This is the gospel Paul said he was not ashamed of preaching in the previous verse. Any gospel that seeks to hush the righteousness of God but elevates the righteousness of man is not the gospel of Christ, no matter how good it sounds. While we seek to teach and uphold right living as the early apostles did, we should not be seen to do injustice to the gospel of Christ by commonizing the gift of righteousness. Grateful, for his righteousness that makes us fit to stand before him. Amen and Amen. Jesus Christ bless you. Kindly share the word.